Welcome to Learning Thursdays. I'm Dean Hale with the Oasis Learning and Development Unit and your host for today's presentation. Today's presentation is titled Recovery Residences 101. But first, a word about Learning Thursdays. Learning Thursdays are offered to behavioral health professionals as a free learning opportunity with the goal of improving the knowledge and skills of the New York State Substance Use Disorder Workforce as we strive to improve the lives of individuals needing prevention, treatment, recovery, and harm reduction services. A goal of Learning Thursdays is to support the professional development of the treatment, prevention, recovery, and harm reduction workforce. We do this by offering regular presentations that are relevant to today's substance use disorder treatment professional. As always, if there are any questions, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to contact us at the Learning Thursdays mailbox. You can use the same mailbox to express an interest in providing a future Learning Thursdays program. And now, it's time to start the presentation and welcome our guests. Hello, uh, my name is Brenda Harris Collins and I am the director of the Recovery Bureau here at New York State Office of Addiction Services and Support. And today I am extremely excited for this presentation on recovery residences. It has been a long time coming uh, for us to be able to present this information to you um, back in April of 2022, the legislature ta tasked OASIS with a voluntary certification of recovery residences in New York State. We have worked on this over two years to get to this point of really being able to understand what uh, we want recovery residences to look like, where we have uh, made a number of visits to recovery residences, and we really have um, are to the point where we want to educate as many as possible on recovery residences. We are at the point where we have been able to really formulate what recovery residences will look like in New York State. And today I am so excited to introduce you to Henry Kurtzman and Jeffrey Strauss, who will present to you today on Recovery Residences 101. So we're very excited to have all our viewers and audience here today. And we would like to start by coming up with some objectives for our viewers. After this presentation, our intent is that participants will be able to define the key components of recovery residences, understand the core principles of recovery and how it differs from treatment, explore the role of personal choice in an individual's recovery journey, as well as learn updates on OASIS's upcoming voluntary certification of recovery residences in New York State. So those are our objectives for the audience today. Good afternoon, this is Henry Kurtzman and I'm glad to be here. Before we begin talking about recovery residences, let's get into the core principle of recovery. Recovery is a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live self-directed lives, and strive to reach their full potential. Recovery is built on individual choice of pathway and recovery support services for all populations. When positive changes and values become part of a voluntary adapted lifestyle, it's called being in recovery. Recovery has many different pathways, which can include 12 step, mutual support, SUD treatment, spirituality, and any other modalities that support the individual on their recovery journey. Okay, so Henry started to talk about recovery. And like we mentioned, we wanna look at the key differences between treatment and recovery which OASIS oversees both. So when we talk about treatment, right? Treatment is an acute approach or model of care. It's designed for a limited time frame. Individuals are in crisis and stabilized within a very short time period. 
So if we look at this graphic here and we look at kind of the left side under treatment, SUD, substance use disorders, they occur when the recurrent use of alcohol and our drugs causes clinically significant impairment, including health problems, disabilities, failure to meet major responsibilities at work or home. So what does treatment look like? What is a, an individual who's seeking treatment? What are they going through? So treatment involves seeking help from a doctor, clinic, social worker, or other professional to stop misusing alcohol or drugs. What might the individual be experiencing? They might need more drugs to feel normal. They might have tried to stop using drugs with no luck. They might often hide the truth about using or acquiring drugs. They might keep taking a drug if there's no longer needed for pain or another health problem. They might have lost interest in things that were like before, such as work or activities. And from a behavior standpoint, they might practice risky or harmful behavior in order to get drugs. So that's treatment. And I'm gonna pass it over to Henry to talk a little bit about recovery. I want to reinforce what Jeff mentioned about treatment being an acute model of care within a short period of time, whereas recovery views SUD through a more chronic lens and attempts to provide nurturing, supportive services for the individual's long-term recovery journey. Recovery, self-directed pathways engaged with recovery supports requires stable supportive housing. SAMHSA through, uh, defined recovery uh, as being developed following the, the following definition of recovery. Recovery is a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live self-directed lives, and strive to reach their full potential. Individuals thinking about recovery housing or seeking support in a home-like environment to continue their recovery journey with or without formal treatment programs. You don't have to be enrolled in a treatment program to avail yourself of a recovery residence. Those individuals may have been diagnosed with SUD or struggled with substance addiction. They may currently be receiving medications for substance use disorder. They're seeking a lifestyle to maintain uh, their sobriety. They may be seeking a structured environment to gain skills to maintain a healthy lifestyle. They may be seeking a peer supportive home environment to maintain their uh, lifestyle. They need extra support or motivation to continue to avoid harmful or risky habits. So those are some of the key features of uh, recovery uh, as opposed to the treatment model, the recovery model. So we're still talking about this concept of recovery. And when we talk about recovery, we often talk about four components known as the four pillars of recovery. As you can see on this slide, the four pillars are health, home, purpose, and community. So if we look at the definitions, health refers to overcoming or managing one's disease or symptoms and making informed, healthy choices that support physical and emotional well being. Home refers to having a stable, safe place to live. We'll come back to that one in a second. Purpose conducting meaningful daily activities and having the independence, income, and resources to participate in society. And finally, community, having relationships and social networks that provide support, friendship, love, and hope. So like I mentioned, today we're gonna to focus on the pillar of home when we talk about recovery residences. We'll also touch on community in terms of linkages. People tend to heal when they are supported in a community rather than isolated, which we will see is a key feature of recovery residences. So these are the four pillars of recovery. 
New York State Recovery Residences. This is the first time recovery residences have been certified in New York State. A voluntary certification process is being developed in order to bring safe, quality care to individuals in need of residential recovery environment. Recovery residences are also known as sober homes, sober living, and three quarter houses. Essential components of certifying recovery residences are a recovery specific application process. As said earlier, this process will be voluntary and non not mandated. Guidance for implementation of the 860 regulations, an entire set of specific regulations were developed uh, for recovery residences and specific to recovery residences are resident rights, incident reporting, and grievance, a code of ethical considerations. All of these were developed in order to support recovery residents provider operators in the implementation of safe quality care. Note the graphic on the side of this slide. Here is what is included in a recovery residence, recovery housing, recovery capital, peer and social support, workforce development, employment, MAT, and community support. We will explore these and other essential components as we go through this presentation. So what is a recovery residence? Recovery residences are a choice. They're not a clinical placement. They provide a physically, emotionally safe, secure, and respectful environment. They have low barriers to access by accepting applicants with poor credit, eviction histories, or criminal backgrounds. They're part of the community and residents are encouraged to connect with local services, support, employment, and social activities. So as you see on the slide here, recovery residences are substance-free living environments. Like we talked about, they're a safe and healthy place for individuals to recover from addiction. Key components, the setting is the service, very important. Different programs under OASIS might have different services. With recovery residences, the setting itself is the service. Key components also inc include interconnections among individuals and with the environment, as well as peer governance, peer leadership, and community wisdom. Recovery residences provide stability and structure that are essential to recovery-oriented systems of care. We'll get more into that concept in a little bit, but that allows individuals to focus on continuing their self-directed recovery journey. Certified residents under OASIS will have standards for quality safe care, which is different than being standardized to one specific model or structure. As there are many pathways to recovery, there are also many different shapes and sizes that a recovery residence might take. They may be shared or congregate. They may be single family homes, apartment buildings, individual apartments. All the houses may also have different philosophical backgrounds. They could be a 12 step house, a house that's based on spirituality. They may house different populations, it could be a veteran's recovery residence, a all women's recovery residence, a men's recovery residence, women with children, and there are even recovery residences that house families. So just looking at some additional components here, additional key features of recovery residences. So individuals in the residence have choice they're not mandated to a specific residence or house. So if an individual in their recovery journey decide that this is an appropriate environment for them, they're not mandated to go to a specific house in a specific location. 
As mentioned earlier, these residences provide low threshold access to entry. They do not require medical or clinical evaluations as a qualification for admission. Residents have their own personal bedroom space and there are shared meeting and common space areas in the residence to reinforce the home-like environment. Linkages may include medical, mental health, substance use disorder, and other holistic services, as well as recovery wellness supports. Residents have choice, like we said, in employment opportunities, as well as training and education. So that is some additional key features of recovery residences. Defining recovery housing in New York State. Uh, the Recovery Bureau in collaboration with uh, resident recovery residence providers developed this definition. And while I read the definition, see what resonates for you. Recovery housing in New York State is a unique and essential service in the OASIS continuum of care for New York State. Recovery housing provides a home-like environment. It incorporates the social model of recovery, social determinants of health, and recovery capital in order to honor the multiple pathways to recovery. Recovery residences provide safe, quality housing by utilizing common set of standards and a code of ethics in their operation, while also linking individuals to a recovery-oriented system of care. This has been the first, certif first certified recovery service in New York State. In looking at the landscape, we identified a few hundred residences already exist in New York State in all different regions. There are some real unique challenges in the cert voluntary certification of recovery residences. How do we standardize and le legitimize the essential work they do to ensure safe and quality housing that supports long-term recovery? How can we incentivize and fund movement towards certification? How can data be collected in a recovery-oriented system of care to inform New York's unique network of recovery residences. As you read this definition, consider which parts of the words of the definition resonate for you. Is it home-like environment? Is it the social model of recovery? Is it safe quality housing? There are several core principles identified in the definition that we will explore in the following slides. The key components of recovery housing are the social model of recovery, social determinants of health, recovery-oriented systems of care, recovery capital, safe quality housing, standards and a code of ethics, and data collection. If we incorporate the social model of recovery, giving recovery housing participants autonomy, voice, and choice, and focus on the social determinants of health, which include linkages to recovery-oriented systems of care, those individuals' recovery capital will increase and be supported by safe quality housing that operates with a set of standards and a code of ethics that's verifiable by data collection, legitimizing the essential work that recovery housing performs. It's a long sentence, but it incorporates all the key concepts into a cohesive structure. Let's take a look at each one of these key components more in depth in the following slides. The social model is essential to recovery residents. The social model emphasizes interpersonal aspects of recovery. Primary rationale for this term was that it emphasized social and interpersonal aspects of recovery rather than approaches that were more individually oriented. It also emphasized peer-to-peer -peer rather than practitioner-to-client relationships. And it replaced the concept of treatment plan with recovery plan. The social model purports that learning happens 
when people interact, when they get opportunities to explore the world, get praise for accomplishment, and gain constructive feedback as they struggle through life's challenges. In many ways, this concept correlates with a strength-based approach that's often spoken about in recovery literature. When people get feedback about their strengths and see them appreciated, they often begin to build self-esteem and then a willingness to try new things or revisit past dreams and to imagine a new life for themselves. The social model provides opportunities for residents to begin to grow again by creating the structures that are ordinarily developed in functional families. In the process of working on interpersonal relationships with residents, we help them to develop a new sense of caring for others and assuming responsibility for their fellow residents, the recovery community, and community at large. The social model or community as healer is the cornerstone of recovery structure, nurturing, kindness, guidance, and unconditional positive regard, and for subsequently foster a culture of recovery. So Henry, you talked about the social model, and now I'd like to get into the next core principle, which is social determinants of health. And we're gonna start discussing that by mentioning the key component of choice. So we mentioned choice already earlier in the presentation, but it's worth kind of expanding on. A core principle is that residents are provided choice in their recovery journey. You may have heard the term social determinants of health, such as food, housing, employment, education, healthcare, treatment, supports, et cetera. Social determinants of health are the non-medical factors that influence health outcomes. They are the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. So we mentioned choice. Residents are provided choice in the areas we just talked about, employment, education, healthcare, and many others. In treatment, this is not treatment, you have to justify medical or clinical necessity. However, in recovery, the focus is on the social determinants of health. These factors support long-term positive outcomes. So you see in the graphic here, social determinants of health and the components that go into it. Social services, employment and working conditions, income and wealth, education, healthcare, food, housing. So that is the core component of social determinants of health. Recovery-oriented systems of care is a coordinated network of community-based services and supports that is person-centered and builds on the strengths and resilience of individuals, families, and communities to achieve recovery and improved health, wellness, and quality of life for those at risk of SUD. OASIS's vision for recovery residences is that they function as an integral part of a larger recovery-oriented system of care, which also includes other components shown in these diagrams. Peer support, mutual aid, employment, mental health, physical health, life skills, recovery centers, uh, houses of worship are all part of this recovery oriented system of care that are mobilized to meet the individual's needs. So our next core principle, we're gonna talk about recovery capital. We're gonna talk about this graph here, this graphic on the recovery ecosystem. So recovery capital refers to the breadth and depth of internal and external resources that can be drawn upon to initiate and sustain recovery from substance use disorder. When we talk about a recovery ecosystem, we're talking about an ecosystem that contains linkages, 
that will support the individual and recovery residents in order to increase their recovery capital. So if we look at this image here from left to right, we're looking at possibly where an individual um, starts their journey, possible referral sources, possibly coming from a criminal justice setting, a treatment provider, counselors, community support, or even self-directed recovery journey. If they start there from left to right, and then they're incorporated or referred to services such as case management, peer support, stable housing, education support, physical mental health, life skills development, employment support. As a result, their recovery capital all the way on the far right here will increase in the areas such as employment, transportation, housing, and social support. So as the individual links to engages and engages with all these aspects in the middle, their recovery capital increases and their chance at better outcomes increase as well. That's recovery capital. How will residences utilize information management or data to support the individual's recovery journey and positive outcomes? Information management includes everything from basic de demographic information of residents to more complex metrics that speak to employment, housing, and other social determinants of health that will impact the individual's recovery journey. Timely, accurate submission of data will quantify the efficacy and effectiveness, the efficiency and the effectiveness of the recovery residents in New York State. Data collection and submission is an essential component of a statewide network of providers. Providers need to develop metrics and utilize data to determine effectiveness and make improvements in their process. When utilized, information management identifies trends, gaps, and assists providers to focus resources in a targeted, intentional manner. This speaks to data-driven decision-making. So Henry started this topic of data. So when we talk about data, we also want to look at what is collecting data on recovery residences and outcomes shown us. So data and research are obviously very interconnected. And we wanna talk about some of the research that data has provided to us. So recovery residences or recovery housing, it's existed throughout the entire country in other states and researchers have studied data and outcomes from these recovery residences. The outcomes have been largely positive. So let's look at some of these statistics and research from some of the many studies that have covered recovery residences. So in these studies, it was found that individuals who resided in a recovery residence, their substance use decreased compared to individuals not in a recovery residence, 31% versus 65%. So essentially cut by more than half their probability of relapse or recurrence, 22% versus 47%. So again, cut in half by being a resident in this environment. Their rate of incarceration was lowered by two thirds, 3% versus 9%. And then their employment, which is really, really nice to see, their employment rates increased 76% versus 49%. So this is a lot of peer reviewed evidence based research and we want to just look at a little bit more here. Another study showing that recovery residences are effective. So studies have detailed the effectiveness of recovery housing in peer reviewed journals by national experts. For example, this organization compared men and women leaving a residential addiction treatment and returning to their prior living circumstances with those leaving treatment and moving into a recovery home or recovery residence. So what was found by this study when comparing the two groups? 
those who went to the recovery homes showed significantly better outcomes at two year follow up. The residents earned over $500 more per month in employment than the other group who were not in the recovery residence. And it was found that communal housing settings enhanced substance use disorder recovery. So another great study showing the effectiveness of recovery residences and their impact impact on outcomes through data. And then just one more when we talk about data and research, we also talk about finance. We talk about financial savings through research and data, which is key. So in addition to the evidence establishing positive recovery outcomes for residents, several studies have calculated the economic costs and benefits of establishing recovery homes, and they have overwhelmingly found that the benefits far outweigh the costs. So in this one study, the researchers documented a cost savings to the community of up to $29,000 per resident when comparing residency in a recovery home with peer support to returning to a community without peer support, without the recovery residents. So where did that figure come from? Where did the $29,000 figure come from? They factored in the potential cost savings for individuals in the recovery residents including factors such as the cost of substance use, illegal activity, and even incarceration that would occur without residing in the recovery residence. So there's all different types of studies and research out there that show the effectiveness for personal outcomes for individuals in recovery residences, and they show the cost or financial benefit to communities, cities, counties, and states. So that is the link to data and research. And we encourage all our viewers to look up any research or articles or peer reviewed evidence. There's a lot out there and it's a very interesting read. So then we'll move on from that. So where are we at with Oasis's voluntary certification process? I'm going to give you some updates. We're really excited about including recovery residences in our robust continuum of care. Uh, towards that end, our 860 regulations were developed and are and were released for public adoption. Uh, they're presently in the New York State Register and. Uh, we welcome you to review those 860 regulations and, and provide comments. Uh, where else have we gone? A unique certification application and accompanying guidance are presently in development and will be available on the OASIS website in the fall of 2024. In conjunction with that, uh, we're projecting that late 2024, OASIS is planning to accept the first applications for voluntary certification of uh, this very much needed service in New York State. Should you have any questions about recovery residences, this is just a short overview to give you the core concepts. Please contact us at recovery at oasis.ny.gov. Again, it's been our pleasure to present to you today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, everyone. I want to thank my guests from the New York State Oasis Recovery Bureau for joining me today. I hope you all find it useful while assisting clients in need of services. Your feedback is important to us. It helps us to know if we are meeting your educational goals and expectations. Once you have viewed the presentation in its entirety and completed the quiz, if prompted, please follow directions to access the SurveyMonkey website and take a moment to complete the evaluation, including suggesting any future topics for Learning Thursdays. Once again, thank you for joining us and keep up the good work.